Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of You Can Exhale Now podcast. And today I am super excited to have Alyssa Mancao on the show today. And she is a licensed mental health therapist who specializes in EMDR. And if you're wondering what that is, you will find out here just shortly. Welcome to You Can Exhale Now, a mindful living podcast for the modern pace, hosted by Lesia Liu. This podcast is for anyone who wants to get more out of life without the burnout. Because when you learn to take proper care of yourself, you have more energy, a more positive outlook, and more gratitude for life. And because you cannot reach your goals if you're tired, overwhelmed, judgmental, angry, and feel sorry for yourself. Each episode, you will learn actionable strategies for self-care, mental health, productivity, better life, work balance, and happiness from coaches, therapists, and experts. Stop holding your breath. You can exhale now. Choose to be a more authentic version of yourself than you've been in a while. Alyssa, welcome to the show. I am really excited to have you here and tell us more a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, You've summed it up pretty well. I am a licensed mental health therapist based in Sherman Oaks, California. That's pretty near Los Angeles. I work with individuals, couples, um, and a lot of the issues that I deal with are helping people working with symptoms of anxiety, depression, and trauma, um, teaching them the skills and um, giving them the opportunity to work with their inner child to kind of attain like a sense of healing and um, mindful living. Let's jump right into it. And can you tell us more a little bit about what EMDR is and uh, what's the science behind it? Sure. Okay. So, and I just kind of want to let people know that even as I describe it, you're probably still going to be left with the feeling with, well, what is it? Because Because even when I do consultations with new clients over the phone, it's one of the questions they ask. And they don't really fully understand what it is until they do it. I have to agree with that. Uh, uh I went through EMDR and my first question was like, what's going to happen to me? Yes, right. It's Uh confusing. Right. So so the listeners will hear as I explain, it's it's still going to be like, what is happening? Um, So what EMDR stands for is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And what it is, is um, we, the therapist, facilitate in helping you, the client, move your eyes back and forth, left to right in a rapid way that mimics the way the eye moves when you're sleeping, right? So we help you, um, we use these tools to help your eye movements go back and forth quite rapidly. And when your eye movements are going back and forth rapidly, what it's doing is it's helping you um, kind of um, uncover and reprocess traumatic memories. Um, so, so what we do initially in the first stages of EMDR is we work with you to help you identify what's a traumatic experience that you've been through. So it starts off with identifying like a traumatic memory or, or a feeling that's kind of been um, lingering in you, maybe associated with a traumatic event. And then we, we help you focus on that feeling and that memory in the beginning stages. And then we help you do the eye movements, thinking about um, a certain event in your life. and then. Once the eye movement starts going, then it kind of helps to, it's like exposures, right? It brings up past thoughts, past feelings, past emotions, past experiences that have kind of been trapped in the body because there's this, um, because it's, it's been identified that what happens to us when we experience a traumatic event, everything in that moment gets trapped in the body with the original pictures, sights, sounds, smells, um, sensations. And when those things get trapped, they're not healed and they come out in different forms Mm -hmm. later in life. So the goal is really to help those experiences come out using your eye movements. So I always tell people, you know, even even if I explain it, it still sounds kind of weird. They actually have they actually have um, EMDR sessions recorded on YouTube. And even if you're watching it on YouTube, you're still going to be like, what is this? So, but, but that's what EMDR is. It utilizes eye movements to reprocess trauma that's been stuck in the body. This is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
I, um, you know, in my own experience, and I think for a lot of people, the word trauma has this really strong, really negative connotation. And most of us believe that if we didn't go through some truly traumatic experiences, you know, you think about like living in a war zone or being raped or um, something like that, you don't really think, uh, you don't really consider yourself traumatized, quote unquote. So can you speak a little bit more to the different types of traumas and um, how do you identify those traumatic experiences that maybe, um, you know, play our life unconsciously and we do not even think of some of these events as being traumatic, but they had such a huge negative effect on our day-to-day life. Absolutely. So then with the MDR, right, there's two, there's concepts, there's two concepts of trauma. There's something called the big T and there's something called the little T. And mm-hmm. what you described were just like the big T's. These are things that we um, identify as traumas. These are things that we see on the news. These are things that we read in the newspapers. These are like these big, oh my gosh, things. And then there are these things um, that are also traumatic that are the little T's. And it, these are often the T's that people ignore, or don't really see as trauma because they're things that happen every day or they're things that have been normalized. But um, other things can be considered trauma, like poverty, racism, inequality, um, bullying in school, neglect, or just uh, having having just like a lot of inconsistent caregiving at home can be traumatic. I also want to clarify: a traumatic event can happen, but not everybody who experiences that event will mm-hmm. experience PTSD or will have symptoms of trauma. Right. Mm-hmm. Everybody's everybody kind of receives, interprets, and copes with events differently, just based on their their coping skills, their baseline, their support system. Right. So so a, a bunch of people can go through a natural disaster, but not everybody will develop signs of trauma. Ultimately, a trauma is anything, big or small, that overwhelms our capacity to cope. Right, and that was said by um, a psychologist, Dr. Dan Siegel, in in one of his educational videos that I was watching um, a few months ago. It's truly any situation that overwhelms a person's capacity to cope. So when they were showing us EMDR videos during our um, trainings, one of the trainings that they had showed was somebody was you know somebody was doing a presentation as an adult and he experienced such intense anxiety about doing the presentation in front of all his colleagues. And there was a fear of sounding stupid. There was this fear of sounding dumb. There was this fear of not being good enough. And then with doing EMDR, they were able to identify that the earliest trauma was actually the looks his father would give him every time he would make a mistake. It was like uh, his father would give him like this look of disgust, this look of disappointment and disapproval. And for that man, experiencing those looks at such a young age was very traumatic for him, right? So the trauma is really subjective to each person and how they're internalizing the events. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so you said, you know, that, part of the EMDR is basically relieving those moments and those feelings and kind of moving them um, through the body because it's been researched that body keeps the score, right? Yes. how, How can you talk a little bit more about how you can move through those experiences, especially when we're talking about really painful memories and, you know, our brain probably doesn't want to go there. And we as a conscious human being do not want to go there and relieve um, those difficult, painful moments of our lives. So can you talk a little bit more to that? That's such a good question. And I mean, it's, it's valid, right? As human beings, when we experience pain, right? Our first instinct is to go away from it right? So when we experience physical pain, our first instinct is to find something or do something to make it feel better. So the same thing goes for emotional pain. Our instinct is to not experience it. Our instinct is to suppress it. Our instinct is to make it go away. Our instinct is to do something else to distract. But um, like you said, we have to move through it. We can't go under it. We can't go over it. We have to go through it. So just going back to EMDR, Um, What EMDR does is it helps you move through those feelings, having a dual awareness. 
So you're in EMDR, you're given the, the experience to feel what you were feeling before while having the awareness that you're not going through it right now. Right. So that dual awareness is really, really important for going through the feeling. When we go through um, a really traumatic feeling, it's our, our mind tricks us into feeling like it's happening all over again. It's happening all over again. I'm not safe. I can't get through this. But that's really untrue. One of the strategies that people can, can use with or without EMDR when they're um, moving through the feeling is to remind themselves, this, this feeling that I'm experiencing right now, it's not permanent, right? Feelings change. This is just part of what I'm going through right now. And just looking, just practicing some sort of grounding, looking around them, right? Like I'm at home. I'm safe. I'm in my car. I'm safe. So it's being able to experience the emotion while recognizing you're not going, that thing that caused it is not happening anymore. So, you know, you, you actually want to go towards that feeling as, as counterintuitive as that sounds, you want to go towards mm -hmm. the pain. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, can you talk about the experience, uh, about the importance of having a safe environment, right? Because uh, I want to make sure that our listeners do not go and try to do it at home and go through every painful uh, emotion oh, or memory they have in life. Oh gosh, yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you for bringing that up. It, yes, <laughs> and you know, it, you know, for for a lot of people, um, therapists, it, we a lot of us are trained that um, sometimes it's it's not it's not beneficial to do any kind of traumatic work if you're not in a safe space, right? So let's say, for example, the traumatic mm -hmm. work is working on a really unhealthy relationship and doing some of the trauma work in that moment might not be safe if you're going to go back to the relationship in the evening, right? So you really, you know, first and foremost, safety is everything. Um, and, and doing this in collaboration with a licensed mental health professional is even safer. Uh, you really want to make sure that you, you, you have the coping skills you have the coping skills first in order to be able to do some of the strategies to go, to lean in towards the traumatic memories and to lean in towards um, the difficult feelings. And it doesn't, it actually doesn't have to be therapy. It's if, if you, if you go to yoga consistently, if you have like a great support network of friends that you meet quite often, if you, if you have a church that you go to, right. As long as you kind of have like a support system that can help guide you through what you're experiencing safe, but, but you definitely have to feel safe. You're in your environment first. Absolutely. And um, you've kind of touched on that, but how can one prepare themselves? Let's say, I would say that EMDR can get pretty intense. It's like therapy on steroids. So mm -hmm. <laughs> when someone is considering um, going through EMDR or even, you know, just trying to do some of that traumatic work um, on their own. Um, you talked about the coping skills. What would be the steps and tips and tools that would help people to develop those coping skills and that feeling of safety? So if, if you do decide, if there's somebody that is interested in doing EMDR, um, one of the beginning stages before the trauma reprocessing even starts is working with your therapist to develop a safe, calm place within you. And oftentimes the therapist will teach you coping and relaxation skills to be able to manage some of the symptoms that are associated with doing EMDR. Um, if, that's, if that's not an option, um, there are so many meditative apps that I do recommend for people. There's actually a lot of guided meditation that's on YouTube. That's really great. One of the things that I do recommend though when when going through EMDR is to really practice breathing to really mm -hmm. practice the deep breathing di di the diaphragmic breathing the being able to con um just control the steadiness of your breathing and to also just notice your thoughts without judging them and recognizing that they're just thoughts journaling is another important tool that i recommend that people do while going through EMDR or while going through any kind of healing journey Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, doing some breath work, uh, meditation, uh, and journaling are some of the best things you can really do anywhere and, and anytime, yeah. every day. Yeah. yeah. 
create. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, there is this interesting concept that you often bring up on your Instagram and it's uh, called inner child. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about the concept of inner child and what it really means to the mental health? Yeah. So inside each and every one of us, there's this inner child, right? Obviously not a physical inner child, but a psychological inner child. And this is the younger parts of ourselves that hold all of the memories, all of the traumas, all of the experiences that we've been through. This is the younger part of ourselves that have held all of the dreams, all of the hopes, and all of the disappointments that we've experienced. Um, Oftentimes when we grow up, we stray a little bit further from our inner child. And the goal of working with our inner child is to teach us how to nourish ourselves, teach us how to be there for ourselves the way we would for Um, the younger version of ourselves, when people experience a traumatic childhood or a childhood with difficulties, um, learning to connect with that inner child and learning how to be there for that inner child actually helps to heal some of the wounds from the past. And um, learning how to reparent that inner child is actually a significant component of healing from any kind of childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. So the inner child is the very subconscious parts of ourselves that are that 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 feels much younger than the age we are currently. Mm-hmm. And can you share some of the tips and tricks on how we can back uh, can get back to our inner child and to connect with them and even get to know them? Because I think a lot of people, as we go through life and especially as we get older, um, we kind of distance ourselves from that child right those childhood um dreams and goals and even personality changes so can you um share some of the tips of how can we go back to it and connect with that very innocent part of ourselves yeah that's actually a really great question so you know the simplest way of connecting with your inner child would probably be to find a picture of yourself at a younger age and really connect with that photo. And something you can do is you can have that photo right next to you and you can start writing a letter to yourself when you were that age. To take it a step further, maybe find a photo of an age where you were struggling the most and you want to write a letter to to yourself at that age and what advice you would give to yourself now. Saying nurturing things to your inner inner child is really good work too. Like, I love you. I I hear you. I'm there for you. You're safe with me. You're valid. You're good enough right? Saying a lot of things to your inner child that maybe you wish an adult would have said to you a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Connecting to your inner child by creating dialogue with that younger self. And again, if it's hard to create that dialogue, pull up a picture. Pull up a picture of the younger version of you and just start talking to it, start writing to it. To her or them. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful practice. Um, You've mentioned that part of like reparenting your inner child what would it mean and let's say if we didn't really have a difficult childhood and our parents did the best they can um you know and we do not experience any kind of like trauma around our actual parents um is there still value and worth in reparenting our inner child and what really does it mean Reparenting your inner child, um, what that means is helping you teach yourself and your younger self how to develop a secure attachment and how to develop healthy coping skills and communication skills. Um, The inner child is like a part of us that feels younger, right? It's a part of us that feels... um, and sometimes it's that part of us that feels unheard, that doesn't feel secure. So when you reparent your child, or your inner child, it's like doing things to help that younger child feel more secure and loved. Um, ways to reparent your inner child. It's it's like setting boundaries with yourself, and and it's it goes back to saying nurturing things to yourself, um, and it goes back to really creating a safe it's also reparenting your inner child could be creating a safe space for that inner child if that if that inner child didn't have a safe space um many years ago did I answer your question did did I miss something anything 
No, I think I think you summarized it perfectly. Um, can you talk about that safe space? Doesn't have does it have to be a physical space or can it be like emotional space? Can it be an activity like going hiking into the nature or steeping yourself some chamomile tea? Like what is a safe space and how can we nurture that safe space for ourselves? Yeah, our safe space can be anything that works for us. Our safe space can really be anything that works for us. It can be a physical space. It can be a space in our home. It can be a space in our room. It can be um, it can be just a place that you go to, like a park. It could be um, it, it could be a safe activity, like going for a walk or reading a book or going swimming. Um, anything that makes us feel kind of peace or joy. Our safe space can be just. A routine in the morning, right? When we get up in the morning and then we, like you said, we drink our tea and we journal, that can be our safe space. So our safe space can be anything physical and it can also be something psychological that we can go to, right? So like um, if you had, let's say a favorite person growing up, maybe a grandparent or maybe um, a teacher, right? So safe space could be a visualization of being with that person. So it can be a psychological safe space too. Cool. And um, you said, you know, vi visualization, how, how big and how effective is visualization in uh, really even reparenting your inner child and um, having the safe space? And what kind of strategies do you have like a favorite visualization you go to with your clients? You know, the, my favorite visualization would be whatever feels safe for them. So something that I do with my clients is I have them close their eyes and I have them identify a safe, calm place. It can be, and this is something I've taken from EMDR, it can be a place that they've been to or a place that they haven't been to, but it could be just like a, a creation of their imagination. And then what I do is I help them really create that safe place by identifying what they see what they hear, what they feel, what they smell, what they can touch, what's around them. Um, and I think that's a really great safe place to go to because you can access it no matter what, wherever you are. Because mm -hmm. yeah. something, that, something that could be a safe space for me might not be a safe space for somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah, and you've touched on like morning routine and how that can be a safe space. And it looks, you know, it seems like a lot of successful people, um, you know, to, to the likes of Bill Gates and Mark uh, Zuckerberg, they all have morning routines and evening routines. Um, how, how can we go about creating one for ourselves and really stick into it? I think a big part um, that, I hear people say is that everyone is really interested in morning routines, uh, but then how do you actually stick to it and how do you develop one that truly works for you and helps you to really take care of yourself and improve and maintain your mental health? Yeah. So first of all, it, it is hard for a lot of people to struggle with sticking with a morning routine. So if you're one of those people, I just really encourage you to practice a lot of self-compassion because it's difficult. Um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's like, do I do my routine or do I get a few more minutes of sleep in, you know, I, I can understand how that could be like a difficult thing, Absolutely. But, this is me. <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, the, the morning routine actually starts the night before. Um, so it's creating like maybe a list of things that you would like to do in the morning, a, a list of what your routine could be. It could be getting up. It could be washing your face then having breakfast and then picking out your clothes. So it's like writing down exactly what it is that you need to do and you would like to get done in the morning. I actually recommend not checking your phone as the first thing that you do. I know that's become such a common thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. let me check. Let me yeah. check if I got any messages. Okay, no messages yep. or messages. Let me check if I got any emails. Okay, now let me see if I got any direct messages. Now let me see if I got any, you know, um, phone calls. It's like kind of like this, this like, uh, everyone's got their own checklist of what they check in the morning on their phone. Mm -hmm. I yep. would actually recommend having that probably be the last thing you do in your routine. Because what happens is when you kind of get stuck in that cycle, then you might find yourself staying on one app longer than you meant to, right? So it ends up taking away from the other parts of your routine. So I would recommend if, if a person can to save that till mm -hmm. when they get in their car, or to save that till after they've eaten their breakfast, 
So those are some strategies for developing a morning routine, identifying the night before what it is that you'd like to get done in the morning, saving, looking at your phone till the end. And also um, the night before ensuring good sleep hygiene. So just making sure that you're not scrolling on your phone, you know, 30 minutes to an hour before bed, um, making sure that you're not, you know, you, you hadn't drink anything caffeinated right before going to bed and just really sleeping in your bed. Your blood is just for sleeping. You're not doing work on your bed. You're not doing homework on your bed. You don't have your laptop on your lap in your bed. You just, you know, you do all of those things before getting in the bed. If you feel that you're going to do something you, you that you want to pull out your laptop and you're in bed, that's fine. Just make sure you then just get out of bed and sit on the floor or sit at a table if you have one or a couch. Mm-hmm. Do the work there and then put it away and then go back to bed because you really also want to adjust your brain into just associating your bed with sleeping. Mm-hmm. So just making sure your sleep hygiene is okay, making sure that you have, this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. This is the time I'm going to leave and then and doing your best, mm-hmm. doing your very best. That's a great advice. And then it's interesting that you've touched on sleeping um, hygiene and sleep in general. Um, I know that doesn't EMDR has something to do with like REM sleep um, and brain waves? Isn't there some connection between the two? You know, EMDR uses the natural functioning of the body, the rapid eye movement. Um, to process any of the traumatic experience that a person might have gone through. So it's what's happening is it seems to stimulate um, the REM, the REM sleep. Uh, so this is when the eye movements are going back and forth during the sleep cycle. And when our eye movements are going back and forth during our sleep cycle, what it's ha- what, what it's happening is it's processing information that's happened during the day and that's happened throughout our lives. And it's kind of categorized categorizing information between long-term, short-term, and then maybe even like, oh, we're going to put this over here. We're going to try to avoid this. We're going to try to forget this. Um, so it processes daily emotional experiences. That's what's happening in REM sleep. So yeah, that uh, EMDR definitely targets the eye movements. That's hap- it, tries, it, it stimulates the eye movements that are happening during REM sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, this EMDR and really any therapy, you know, as you go to discuss um, traumatic experiences or events or um, dealing with any kind of different like mental trauma, um, there is a big need for self-compassion. And you've mentioned, you know, self-compassion. How can one develop self-compassion? Because I think a lot of us carry around not only anger at the other people, but there's a big like guilt and shame within us, which sometimes can be even more detrimental to our mental health you know the judgments that we pass onto ourselves are usually much more rougher (laughs) than what we um, uh, pass on to other people Mm -hmm. one of the ways that that a person can practice and self-compassion is to um, practice forgiveness forgiving yourself for the things that you've done, forgiving yourself for the things, for the mistakes that you've made, practicing mindfulness. So probably just noticing the negative things that you're saying to yourself, the negative feelings that you're having towards yourself, noticing what you're going through without judging it. Because one of the things I notice is when a person is hard on themselves, like they feel really bad that they did something, then they get angry at themselves for feeling bad. Then they get disappointed in themselves for having such a strong reaction, Mm -hmm. right? So mindfulness really helps people noticing what they're experiencing without judging themselves for it. Because when you judge yourself for it, then it makes the experience a lot harder to go through. Um, another way to practice self-compassion is to just remember that it's it's okay. It's okay to feel the way that you feel. It's okay to make mistakes, reminding yourself that nobody's perfect and that you're not alone. Um, self-compassion and inner child work really go hand in hand. So whatever um, difficulties you're experiencing, Maybe envision yourself at a younger age, five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. Imagine that younger you going through the same thing. And what advice would you give that younger version of yourself? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, with forgiving ourselves, I think a lot of people are struggling with that because we believe that we need to beat ourselves up in order not to repeat the same mistake because... Mm -hmm. If you have acted selfish or you treated other people badly, then 
if you forgive yourself, it's almost like you're saying, oh, it's okay that I did all of those mm-hmm. things. Um, so I think we almost assign value and worth to beating ourselves up and not yeah, forgiving yeah. ourselves. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I don't think it's healthy to beat ourselves up, right? When we beat ourselves up, we get stuck in that feeling and it doesn't really do anything to promote growth. Right. So if anybody can think about a time where they've been shamed by another person or where somebody was really, really um, like beating them up for something, you know, I, I can imagine that that didn't motivate them that that much. It probably kept them stuck for a little bit. It probably kept them feeling really down or feeling really upset, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and practicing self-compassion, practicing self-forgiveness. It's not like you're saying, oh, what I did was OK. But what it's saying is I'm 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 ready I'm, I'm ready to work towards resolving the hurt that this has caused me, mm-hmm. right? It does not mean what you're saying that you did or what the other person did is okay. It, it, you're not agreeing with what happened at all. Um, mm-hmm. You're just saying it, it's, it's, it's a sign of I'm ready to start resolving the pain. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much, Alyssa. I think this was a really beautiful conversation. And uh, I think a lot of people uh, can find ways to connect with their inner child and to maybe forgive ourselves for the past mistakes and hurt. And hopefully, um, there will be people who will find EMDR useful and um, might want to find out more about the therapy. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you've learned a lot of new strategies. Be sure to check out the notes below this episode for additional resources and tools mentioned in today's show. I would love to keep the conversation going. Share your thoughts and takeaways with me on social media channels, wherever you are. And do not forget to tag me. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you, and I will see you on the next episode. If this podcast has helped you even a little bit, please leave a review and subscribe so that we can help spread the message together.